Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Blog Rider podcast. Now, once again, I'm going to play up to the stereotypical Brit reputation and complain about the weather. I mean, as an outdoors kind of guy, the weather here in the UK at the moment is just killing my spirit. And I think my vitamin D levels must be severely depleted. So please send more sunshine. And as I'm going to spend five days in a tent at the Glastonbury Festival in a few weeks... I really am serious when I say send some sun our way, but not too much you understand as the feeling of being cooked alive in a tent is not so good either. But if you are going to the Glastonbury Festival, let me know and maybe, just maybe, I'll meet you for a beer whilst listening to some music. How does that sound? But I digress. On today's show, I want to explore about how autonomous technology teams can help businesses respond rapidly to change and also promote innovation and experimentation, which will ultimately drive decision-making closer to customers. But I also want to explore how, yes, autonomy is a great thing, but without adequate guardrails in place, it can result in a technology organisation without a clear direction and without a clear purpose. So to balance this, alignment of some form is always necessary. But how much and what style? This is where I turn to a guy called Eugene, who's the VP of Platform Strategy at a company called Simpris. So I asked him to come on today and share some of his insights. And Simpris is also on NASDAQ as CMPR, and they invest in and build customer-focused entrepreneurial mass customization businesses for the long term. And the company was actually built on and passionate about empowering people to make an impression through individually meaningful personalized physical products. And yes, that is all the rage here. But what makes Simpra stand out for me is they've been doing this for 20 years. So buckle up and hold on tight so I can beam your ears all the way to Boston. So we can speak with Eugene Asu, VP of Platform Strategy at Simpris. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Eugene. Can you tell the listeners a little more about who you are and what you do? Well, yeah. So I'm at Simpress, and I know Simpress isn't exactly a household name. So uh, let me start with that. So we're the parent company of a bunch of businesses, I think over a dozen right now. Um, It's kind of like how Alphabet is Google's parent company, and relatively few people know about Alphabet. And I think that's why uh, Simpress isn't exactly a very well-known brand. Um, At a high level, our businesses focus on offering customizable physical products online. And I think our most well-known brand, at least in the U.S., is Vistaprint. Um, And in the U.K., I think uh, you guys have Vistaprint, too. Um, But we also have National Pen over there. Uh, We also have Tradeprint over there. So we have this uh, group of businesses. I'm actually in the central part of the company. Uh, It's the core organization that's dedicated to building this internal technology platform that serves all of our businesses. And where I'm situated, I work on the platform strategy. And uh, I guess before that, I had roles in engineering and research and innovation. But that's where I am right now. And we do have Vistaprint over here in the UK. I've used it a couple of times myself. But whenever you try and buy anything, they keep trying to upsell you so many different things. I think it was business card I wanted once. And it was like, do you want a T-shirt? Do you want a towel? (laughs) Well, (laughs) Well, did you buy any of them? I, I didn't know. I, I, stuck to the, I stuck to the business cards. <laughs> yeah. But well, at that's, Simpris, that's... You, you build entrepreneurial mass customization businesses. But can you help people listening understand the kind of problems that you're solving for businesses and also the value that you're delivering for customers? Right. So uh, I see you visited our website. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah uh, mass customization, um, It's. Uh, I guess it comes across as a buzzword, but... Um, At a high level, the idea of mass customization is combining the benefits of mass producing physical products with the flexibility of individual customization. So uh, those benefits might include things like cost, uh, quality, speed. Um, So if you want a tangible example, um, you're talking about uh, ordering business cards, but let's say you wanted nice tech blog writer branded notebooks or laptop bags or uh, coffee mugs to give us gifts to some of your business partners. So if you just wanted maybe like five or 10 of them to start with, the unit costs, at least traditionally, they'd be really high compared to if you ordered, say, a quantity of 
like a thousand. So the idea behind mass customization, uh, at least the way we see it, is to make this sort of custom product accessible to people who don't need these super high quantities. And so that's uh, ultimately, I think, the value that Simpress businesses deliver to their customers. And so the reason I'm using the term their customers is, uh, like I said, I'm in part of this central platform organization and uh, we actually consider the Simpress businesses to be our customers. And so the products that we build are these technology components that help them serve uh, their customers better. And like you said, customization could be, um, in, in some circles, is, is a bit of a buzzword at the moment. But we're also hearing a lot about autonomous technology. But can you share how autonomous teams can actually help businesses respond rapidly to change? And actually, by doing so, promote innovation and experimentation at the same time? Yeah. So when we talk about autonomous teams, uh, we're talking about teams that are usually cross-functional and small that have the freedom to define their own goals and uh, the contrast is to these, uh, you know, top-down command and control types of organizations. And so I think uh, this form of organization is fairly common at tech companies. It's becoming increasingly common at other companies and other industries, uh, but it didn't used to be the case. And so in terms of like some of these benefits in, uh, for innovation and experimentation, I guess I'll tell you a story about when I started at Simpress. Actually, we were Vistaprint back then. We only became Simpress a few years ago. But I remember um, as an engineer at Vistaprint, um, the process for getting an idea off the ground was actually pretty complicated. We were, uh, you know, we had to come up with something. Then we pitched it. We moved, pushed it up the org chart pretty much into the central business planning process. And that was the same whether you're in engineering or marketing or anywhere else in the company. And, of course, after it get pushed up, uh, you have all these approvals, you have all these processes in place. Ultimately, it ran on this, I guess, biannual cycle. Um, sorry, semi-annual, I think is the term. Every six months. And so in the end, as you can imagine, the amount of communication and management overhead in getting any idea off the ground was pretty big. You know, like sometimes it seemed like it took more time to propose and approve an idea than it took to actually build it. And uh, so as you can imagine, that, that sort of thing really slowed us down, and it slows a lot of companies down when you have to go through these processes. So over the years, when we moved to having these more autonomous uh, teams, um, it's been great for being able to get ideas moving much more quickly in terms of both you know, testing them and actually getting them in the hands of customers. And as I read a lot about, I read too many blog posts and too many tech articles every single day, but I recently read that autonomous technology can also drive decision-making closer to customers. Is that something that you're seeing and something that you can expand on too? Well, uh, I guess one thing is to distinguish between autonomous technology and autonomous teams. Um, autonomous technology, I think, when I hear that, I think of uh, self-driving cars and yeah. stuff, right? Um, but when we're talking about autonomous teams, uh, you know, th this is more about um, the the org structure. Um, so in terms of autonomous teams, um, like I was saying, in the old model, a lot of these decisions were being made by senior executives. Um, and senior executives, by their very nature, uh, it's part of their jobs. They end up being very um, detached from what's happening from the ground. They have to see this very high up, you know, 30,000 feet, feet view. Um, it's really the people like the software engineers, um, analysts, user experience designers, marketers, uh, or whoever, uh, those are the folks who are directly seeing how customers engage with their work. And so if you have these small, autonomous, cross-functional teams, you have this benefit of having all of these perspectives uh, in the same room or, or maybe in tech companies, the same Slack channel, and they have the power to act on what they're seeing uh, without having to deal with all that corporate bureaucracy. And so the good thing about that speed is that you can quickly test and learn from your customers directly instead of getting locked into this analysis paralysis cycle of getting through you know, the corporate whatever. Yeah, it's something we've all seen more than uh, on more than one occasion. And as I think, I don't know if it's just the IT guy in me, but when we're looking at autonomy without those guardrails in place, it sometimes can result in technologies or, sorry again, it can sometimes result in a technology organization without clear direction or purpose. I'm going to do that whole thing again. I've read that completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> okay. 
Now, autonomy without some guardrails in place can result in a technology organisation without a clear direction or purpose. So how you see, how do you think that senior leaders can find that right balance of autonomy and alignment at the same time? Yeah, um, that is a risk for sure. I mean, sometimes when you hear about autonomous teams, you figure it's like the Wild West. It's this anarchy where everybody's doing everything. And um, uh, usually that doesn't work. Um, But I think there are a few things that are key. And in my opinion, the main one in terms of getting that alignment is to make sure that the leaders have a very clear and consistent uh, point of view about where the company is going and, and really they need to state that vision clearly and repeatedly. And so I think this is uh, easier said than done because if you think about like your standard corporate um, meeting, you think of, uh, you know, an annual all hands meeting where all the employees show up, uh, the senior executives uh, put the vision on a PowerPoint slide, uh, you know, stick it there and then just call it a day. Everybody leaves the room after the meeting, uh, gets back to their business and keeps doing what they're going to do. Um, That can work, I think, when you have this traditional type of organization, which is very hierarchical, where the leaders have to translate that vision and then push it down into action items. But when you have autonomous teams, it's different because you're trusting those teams to do the translation. And so what the leaders have to do is really get behind the why of what the company is trying to accomplish uh, and reinforce it constantly. Like if a team Uh, has a success. You not only celebrate that success, but you also state how that success contributes towards that overall vision. Um, So on top of that, I think there are lots of structural things that leaders can put in place to keep things uh, orderly, I guess. Um, You can give teams a distinct area of ownership. Um, You can promote the sharing of knowledge between teams through things like, uh, say, internal blogs or documentation portals. Uh, You can enforce standards about how teams should interact with each other. I think uh, the best story I have about this is uh, there's this, uh, I I guess, infamous blog post uh, about uh, Jeff Bezos's mandate back in the day at Amazon about how teams had to expose their data and functionality only through service interfaces over the network. No sharing of code, no sharing of databases, no nothing like that. And I think this ultimately... Um, was responsible for a lot of the growth and innovation that Amazon was able to accomplish over the many years since then. And I think last but not least, um, uh, measuring teams by business outcomes instead of output metrics. Um, A lot of times, like, I mean, the stereotypical example here is like, you don't want to just say, hey, how many lines of code did you write? Did you finish all the tickets? You want to actually see what the business results are. Absolutely. And we are going to have business leaders listening from all over the world. And some of them could be sat there on the commute to the office one morning thinking, this is great, but what does it mean for me? So for those people listening, can you tell me more about how the competitive landscape of mass customization and how platform strategies can be applied to their businesses and make a real difference to them too? Yeah. um, So um, mass customization is a really exciting space, I think. Um, in terms of how mass customization is applied to to businesses, I th- I think the impact, at least with brands like uh, Vistaprint especially, is that we're really trying to empower business owners to brand and market themselves more effectively. And I know that businesses are constantly evaluating this balance between uh, whether to put your marketing and brand dollars in physical or digital. But if you think about all the different Uh, physical representations of your brand. Um, You know, I I think of the coffee shop I go to that has branded coffee cups or even the bags where I take out my scones when I get one. Um, If you think about, uh, let's say you're a a small business launching your uh, business on Kickstarter, uh, the widget that you end up selling, uh, whether it's some cool pen or gadget, uh, you want to get that beautiful unboxing experience to really reinforce what your company is about. And so I, I think there's a ton of really cool um, physical objects that are never going to go away, even as we start moving more digitally. Um, in terms of the competitive landscape of um, mass customization, um, there are a ton of really interesting uh, areas, I think, that um, that are get, just getting explored right now. Um, I actually caught this article in The Atlantic. Um, it was literally yesterday. And I think the title of the article was something like, um, gosh, let me look at it real quick. Suddenly everything can be personalized. 
And it talks about these new companies that are offering uh, personalized, customized makeup, hair care products, uh, vitamins. There are a lot of companies that are doing custom made to measure apparel. So if you want a um, custom suit, you can go online and get one made to the exact measurements of your body. Not at bespoke you know, fancy uh, tailor prices, but pretty much at the same prices as you can get um, at your typical department store. And, and so those are really uh, interesting directions for mass customization. Um, in terms of how platform strategies are applied, um, I think there's two different models of platform strategies that we can talk about. Um, one of them is, uh, I would call it more of an Uber or Airbnb type model, where they aggregate customer demand and then they route it to supply that they don't own. So in the case of Uber, you have this global network of drivers. In Airbnb, you have a global network of apartments. Um, in terms of our industry, um, you can have potential access to a global network of specialized manufacturing facilities for all sorts of different mass customized products. Um, there's also another view of platforms that's uh, more about uh, building a foundation for innovation. And so if you think of companies like uh, Shopify, are you familiar with Shopify? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, or, or, you know, WordPress or any of the blogging platforms, right? I mean, certainly you're familiar with WordPress. But I think the idea is um, a, a, a technology core that people can build upon to do great things. And uh, there are a lot of really cool businesses now, I think, that are uh, providing these technology manufacturing backends so that if you want to start offering your own mass customized products, um, you can build upon that. And so I, I think there's all sorts of really fascinating things out there um, in terms of really applying this mass customization mindset to the physical space. I'm curious, do you have any examples of partners or clients that you've actually taken on this journey just to help listeners visualize like a before and after picture of the kind of tangible benefits that it can bring? Um, so like I said before, um, I work in this, uh, internal central platform organization. Yeah. And so a lot of the benefits that we are providing are actually to our Simpress businesses. So I can talk a bit about that. So, uh, I guess up to a couple of years ago, Simpress was essentially a collection of these vertically integrated businesses. Um, and they each had their own technology teams, uh, manufacturing facilities, customer service teams, uh, and so on. And like I mentioned before, um, you know, the central technology organization considers these businesses to be our clients and partners. And so in terms of what our platform has brought them, I think um, it's brought them a ton of benefits. Uh, for one, they can use these modern technology components uh, to really power their businesses instead of having to deal with it all on their own. And that leaves them with much more time and money to focus on what they do best uniquely for their own customers. It's sort of like if you think of uh, technology platforms like Amazon Web Services, a lot of tech companies use AWS so they don't have to manage their own servers or build their own AI machine learning systems uh, and so on and so forth. I think another big win is because they're using these common technology components it makes it much easier for the different businesses to share stuff like manufacturing facilities. Um, so many of our businesses, for instance, are, are they can sell each other's products uh, in a white label fashion, uh, allowing them to increase selection, uh, serve more geographies, uh, ultimately help their customers more. Um, and, and in terms of benefits, I think like so, Simpress and its businesses, we have a number of third party uh, manufacturing partners. And so I think uh, there's a benefit to them as well because it used to be that if you wanted to sign on and fulfill products for Simpress, uh, you, you ended up just connecting to one business and that was it. And integration with another business uh, required you know, a completely independent process. But now when a third party joins uh, one of our Simpress businesses, they're essentially joining our network, our marketplace. And so that allows them to have far greater reach for uh, their products. Um, so I think ultimately we're still on this journey. Um, there's a lot of great progress we're making, um, but uh, there's there's more coming and I'm excited. And do you believe that like an internal technology platform can actually give a company a competitive advantage? Because that's the way it sounds like listening to you then. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's certainly helping us, but the truth is I think the answer to that depends on what kind of company you're at. Yeah. Um, if you're a small company, a startup, 
uh, I think it's pretty unlikely, honestly, that you'll benefit from building an internal technology platform because that just creates a lot of, um, you know, unnecessary overhead. Uh, and ultimately, you do have, you know, if you're at a startup, for instance, uh, your entire company is a small autonomous team. Like everybody might very well be sitting in the same room you know, eating pizza together or whatever. And I think if you're a larger business like like us, the answer I think there is still maybe. Um, I think the key is how diverse your business needs are. Like, um, for instance, we have uh, some businesses that focus on um, micro business owners in the United States. Um, other parts of our, uh, other businesses that we have focus on, say, professional trade marketers, printers in the UK. And so we have this diversity of customer needs that really benefits from having these flexible technology components that can be configured and reassembled each way. I think internally, uh, we often talk about a Lego building block strategy where, you know, you have this bucket of wonderful parts that, uh, that you can just piece together into whatever you want. And ultimately, that, that really helps, uh, helps us out. Um, but I think ultimately there's there's not really a clear cut answer here. Um, some businesses would really benefit from internal tech platforms. Others may not as much. Um, it's always very tempting whenever you think of any sort of uh, you know architecture or organization or business strategy to say, hey, we want to adopt it because it sounds cool. But it, it really depends on the details, I think. And you did say a few moments ago, obviously, you're excited about the future. So I've got to ask, I mean, what's next for Simpress? Is there anything else that you can share with me about that road ahead? Well, I'm trying to think of what I can say without getting in trouble. Yeah. But um, <laughs> maybe maybe leave us with a teaser. Let, let me, let, I'll just say this. You know, we have this traditional area that we've operated in, which is, you know, print and promotional products. And a lot of our businesses have focused on that. But we are also... Uh, bringing on board uh, other businesses and other domains of mass customization. And so one of the really cool ones, I think, is uh, this company called Vita, based out of uh, the U.S. And it's this really cool site where artists can create and sell these custom dresses or purses or uh, candles, uh, pillows, just lots of home goods, jewelry, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, so, you know, if you're a creative person and you want to start essentially launching your own fashion line, uh, Vita can help you with that. And they deal with a lot of the manufacturing and e-commerce side. Um, it, it's a big jump forward from these fashion type sites where essentially all you're doing is uploading a picture onto a t-shirt. And so that's a really cool space that's expanding our view of mass customization. Another one uh, of our businesses is called YSD. Um, it's in China. And what their focus is, is on really empowering these established brands to add mass customization capabilities to their own businesses. And so um, I don't think I'm allowed to mention their customers, but uh, let's say, for instance, you were an upscale fitness apparel company. Maybe you make yoga pants or something, and you want to add the ability for customers to buy customized versions of those products on your own websites or maybe even in your uh, stores. And so YSD is a brand that would help you uh, with that sort of stuff behind the scenes. And I think um, these are both really stretching beyond what Simpress has traditionally played in. Um, but I think the broader point to get back to some of our discussion about platforms and autonomous teams is this question of what's next for Simpress. Um, we really want to put that in the hands of our team members. So instead of having that question being answered only in the CEO boardroom, uh, you want to give the power of the what's next to the employees, the software engineers, the marketers, the customer service agents to come up with these cool ideas. And so I would, I think I could say that the future of the company um, is more now in the hands of our talented team members and also the customers that they serve every day. And you've just given me a great idea for customized merch. Tech blog writer yoga pants. I'm going to be looking that one up. <laughs> I think uh, I'll, I'll set you up. <laughs> <laughs> now, before I let you go, could I ask that you remind everyone listening of where they can find out more information about Simpress and equally and, and the kind of work that you're doing and some of the businesses you work with? What's the best way of doing that? Yeah, so um, Simpress.com is our website. Uh, it talks about our company, our strategy, and it also has links to all of our businesses, so you can visit all of those. Uh, we regularly post stuff on our LinkedIn page, 
And uh, I guess you can also feel free to add me personally on LinkedIn, chat me up. I don't post much myself, but I love talking about this stuff. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. Excellent. Well, I'll add all those links to the blog post that accompanies this podcast, along with that Atlantic article that we mentioned as well. I cannot thank you enough for coming on today. I love what you're doing and how you're using technology here. But more than anything, just a big thank you for coming on and joining me and being so open about the work that you're doing. Thanks again, Eugene. Yes, thank you very much for having me. I loved exploring the competitive landscape of mass customization with Eugene today and how Simpris as a company are advising leaders on how platform strategies can be applied to any business. And we did cover a lot of ground today and there were so many big talking points. Some of you will be left with many, many more questions, probably more questions than answers. Others of you may be left with strong opinions and others will just shrug their shoulders and think, well, whatever. (laughs) But whatever today's conversation made you feel, I want you to share it with me. And you can do that by emailing me techblogwriter at outlook.com or, of course, catching me on Twitter at Neil C. Hughes. Now, I started this podcast as a stereotypical Brit complaining about the weather and I'm going to go out playing the role as a stereotypical podcaster. I want to ask you now to please, wherever you listen to the show and whatever platform you listen, if you do have a few moments and you enjoyed the episode or you enjoy listening to the show, please leave a quick rating or review because it really does help grow our community. But I don't just want you to leave me a rating or review. Let me know you've done it as well. Let me give you a shout out and a thank you. But that's it for today's episode. So a big heartfelt thank you for tuning in each day. I love you all. You must know that by now. But until next time, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.